This, this is not a very quantitative talk. This is just to throw some ideas at you about some other things we could do, be doing for SETI, because I think that maybe we should consider some other ideas. We do consider other ideas, but this is mostly to provoke you. Uh, and so let's do that. To begin with, of course, the idea that we're alone, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's unproven whether we're alone or not alone, of course. But on the other hand, if you think that this is the only world where intelligence, and intelligence is defined by you being able to build radio transmitters, and you can judge for yourself whether you're intelligent or not. <coughs> if you think that's the only place where that's arisen, and there are plenty of people who believe that, uh, then you believe in miracles, right? Because, after all, this is the order of magnitude of the number of planets in our galaxy. If you talk to Jeff Marcy and ask him what fraction of the stars have planets, he'll say, well, probably a half or maybe more, and a half, of course, is the same as one for astronomers. So, <laughs> that's a large number. We don't know how many of those are, of course, habitable worlds. Kepler will answer that in about another 700 days. One of the most interesting experiments, certainly, of, of, of this century and maybe of several other centuries. Uh, the smart money, which is to say the people who work at NASA Ames, uh, figure that they'll find a few percent of star systems have Earth-like worlds. If that's the case, then the number of Earth-like worlds is on the order of tens of billions in our galaxy. Right? So that's a big number, and it's hard to believe that they're all sterile or they're all merely infested with uh, single-celled life forms. Okay, now let's get on to SETI. This is a fellow who's somewhere in the audience shaking his head, no, 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 that's what he promised to do all during this talk. <laughs> There's the antenna Frank used 50 years ago to uh, look at two nearby sun-like stars about a dozen light years away, and he established the strategy for targeted searches, which are the kinds of SETI experiments we have traditionally done here at this institute, not exclusively, but that's the, the sort of experiment we do mostly, where we look, we, we take the telescopes and we point at certain spots on the sky. We don't survey the entire sky in general. The people at Berkeley do do that, uh, but we don't, on the assumption that if you're looking for life in the, uh, in the desert, maybe you should skip the sand and just look at the oases. So, we tend to look at star systems individually, and Frank had done that. He looked at two stars. He was optimistic enough to think that looking at two was a sufficient sample that maybe success would occur. We now know that it's not. Uh, and we've looked at more stars, but not an enormously larger number. In fact, the, the number of star systems that have been looked at carefully over a wide range of frequencies with high sensitivity was done with the SETI Institute's Project Phoenix, which extended over most of a decade, used antennas in uh, Australia, Green Bank, West Virginia. Clearly the aliens are arriving. <laughs> and an error of sea Okay, but that number is fewer than a thousand. Fewer than a thousand, and, and I hardly need to point out to you that a thousand, a sample of a thousand, is also not very large. Okay. In fact, this is a graphic, and Joe probably knows the history of this graphic. Uh, this is a graphic that was made for a popular, uh, I think it was an article in Scientific American. Yeah, Scientific American. Anyhow, and, and so it's some years old, but it, you know, it isn't substantively changed from what you see here, showing the amount of search space, how much of the uh, parameter space has been looked at for SETI signals. And of course, the parameter space shown here is only a small fraction of the actual parameter space. There are only three shown here. In fact, of course, there's something like nine parameters you can think of easily, polarization, you know, sensitivity, and so forth and so on, uh, that are not here. Well, I think sensitivity sort of is. But in any case, this is very sparsely populated. That's the point, right? And so when you hear people commenting on the fact that, well, SETI's had 50 years to succeed and hasn't, that doesn't mean anything, right? You can say it does mean something. Paul Davies has said that in his latest book. But even he will admit that it really doesn't because the sample size is still, still too small. All right. Now, the Allen Telescope Array, uh, which I think many of you have already heard much about the Allen Telescope Array, I know Joe has given talks about it and others here, is designed to remedy a lot of this problem by increasing the amount of search space we look at. And indeed, this is an old graph now that I made numerous years ago when our hopes for funding were somewhat more sanguine than they've turned out to be. B, but in any case, so this assumed that the Allen Telescope Array would be up to a couple of hundred elements by now, 
but you could just shift this curve to the right, depending on your views of future funding. And what it, what it shows is how far out into the galaxy this kind of instrument can do targeted searches, right, at, at reasonable sensitivity and over a wide range of frequencies. And so obviously it just goes out for a while until you get to the point where you're so far out that the galaxy now begins to look flat, and then you know, it changes shape a little bit and then continues to go up. The interesting thing in this graph, of course, are those numbers at the bottom. These are the ends in Frank's equation, the Drake equation. And they show when you can expect success if you think this experiment could find a transmitting society. Carl Sagan figured there were a million societies in the galaxy broadcasting, and if that's the case, and success is not far off. If you take Frank's number, which is the most conservative of the generally proposed numbers, 10,000, then it takes another two dozen years for success. But there is something to be darned from this. You could, you could say, well, I mean, this all assumes some value for n. Yes, it does. Right? It also assumes that this instrument is capable of finding the si signals, which, yes, it does. But on the other hand, these are the premises of the whole SETI enterprise ever since the beginning. Right? These were the bases on which the first experiments were done and subsequent experiments were done. So you can believe them or not, but if you think that SETI has value, that the premises are reasonable, then what this says is that success is not three generations down the road. It will happen within a generation where there's something wrong with the fundamental assumptions. Okay, now, there is another point here that I'll, it's kind of a light motif for this talk. So I hate to dignify it with that term, but I am. And that is that we have assumed in our targeted searches that the aliens are patient, that they have perseverance, right? Now, what do I mean by that? That means that they are targeting, at least maybe not us, but this direction, for long periods of time. Okay. Now, here you see a number. This is the uh, typical sensitivity of SETI searches. Some are a little better, a lot of them not quite as good. But that's a typical number, 10 to the minus 25 watts per meter squared. By the way, that's, that's obviously you know, not many. That's not many ERG. It's been said that all the energy collected by all radio telescopes since the first experiment is the amount of energy expended by a flea hopping. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, but, but nonetheless, that's, that's the number. But here's how you can translate that number. If the aliens are a thousand light years away and they have an antenna as big as the one down in Puerto Rico, then we would hear them, even at a thousand light years, which is quite far. They're, you know, a million stars more within that distance. If their transmitter power is six megawatts, uh, we would hear that. Okay. Now, six megawatts is not so much. I mean, the Arecibo antenna has a radar set. It has a Kleistron on it, which is running, I think, at two megawatts now. Certainly one megawatt. So, you know, essentially, with the kind of equipment we can build, uh, we could hear these guys at, at certainly hundreds of light years away and maybe a thousand light years away. But the assumption is that they're always on the air. That when we look, and we typically look at a given star system at a given frequency for only a few minutes, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, that they're sending a signal our way. Now, this has been likened to the possibility that, you know, you fire a a pistol, and your bullet happens to intercept a, a bullet coming the other way. Um, I'll get back to that. There is this question, however, will the aliens really do this? Would they relentlessly target the Earth? Okay. Uh, that quickly leads to discussions, particularly if you put this on the web or someplace like that. This leads to discussions about alien sociology, which, as Chris Chibo pointed out to me once, has a very sparse data set. <laughs> And in particular, what would motivate them to relentlessly target us? <coughs> uh, one suggestion is that they are aware of our manifold difficulties. People somehow think we have more difficulties now than we did, for example, in the time of the Romans. I would submit to you that probably had more difficulties then. But anyhow, you know, well, they're, they're worried about what we're doing to the environment. Or they're worried about what we're doing to endangered species. Or they're worried about what we're doing to... You know, the institution of marriage, or whatever your favorite thing is. <laughs> so they want to get in touch to help us. So that gives some motivation for them to relentlessly aim their transmitters our way. Well, let me just point out to you that that's not going to work. We've been broadcasting our presence for, well, the first uh, FM radio broadcast was 1938, I believe, at least in the United States, and I think that was the first anywhere commercial. Uh, but say, since the war, we've had high-frequency, high-power broadcasts. FM, television, radar. So 60, 70 light years out, you'd be, you, you could find homo sapiens. Beyond that, I don't think you could find homo sapiens. It'd be very, very difficult. I mean, how could you find the classical Greeks? 
How could you find, even the Victorians, they didn't have electric lights till the 1870s, almost 1880s, right? So it, very, very difficult to find us until after the Second World War. Now, within 60 light years, right, the, the number of stars is on the order of 8,000 or 10,000, but in fact, they can't be more, more than 30 light years away at that distance in order to have had enough time to pick up I Love Lucy, decide they don't like Fred Burtz's jokes, and then send relentlessly this transmission back to us. But a couple of thousand stars is not a big number. In fact, I, I submit to you that that is too few, that is too small a number for anyone to know that homo sapiens exist. This may help you to sleep better at night knowing that nobody knows we're here. It should also give pause to the people who claim that we're being visited, which is about one-third of the population. Because <laughs> There is a, you laugh, but you know, one third of the people in here. <laughs> I get emails every day from people having difficulties with aliens in their personal lives. Um, but, you know, you, you do have to ask, why are they here now? Why did they come and abduct the trilobites? And you could argue, well, maybe they did, and the trilobites didn't write it down. That's true. But it is, it is remarkable, remarkable that it should be happening just in time to improve your social life. Okay, uh, so I, I think this has a consequence for SETI. See, they, they don't know we're here. So they can't be targeting Earth because they're trying to get in touch with our species. <coughs> they don't know about our species. Well, the obvious rejoinder to that is to say, well, that's okay, because they're just broadcasting to the entire galaxy. But that turns out to be expensive, at least, if they do so at a level that makes it easy for the kinds of SETI experiments we've run to detect. <coughs> They would need for an omnidirectional broadcast on the order of 10 to the 17 watts with the transmitter power. Now, uh, you know, they could save a few factors of two here and there by confining it to the galactic plane and so forth, but you don't save orders of magnitude by doing that. So 10 to the 17 watts is a lot. That's kind of Earth's insulation. That's the total sunlight falling on the Earth. And as Barney Oliver used to say, you know, waveguides melt. He would say that. I mean, he would say that in context that really didn't have anything to do with any of this, but it's just a good comment. But what he was trying to say is that very big transmitters, you know, there, there may be limitations to very big transmitters. Now, Jim Benford's in the audience somewhere, and he's done a lot of thinking about how you can build very big transmitters and beacons and so forth. But if you're going to go to an omnidirectional broadcast, this is the, the, the power requirement for you in order to make something that would be easily detectable by us. So summarizing this little argument here, the idea of looking for always-on signals, I think, founders on the fact that there's no obvious motivation for them to target Earth in particular, and to target everywhere is very expensive. Okay, So that doesn't sound to me like there's this always-on powerful signal. How do we deal with this? Well, we can be smart. Uh, one way to be smart, of course, is to you know, forego the assumption that they're broadcasting at such a level that our experiments could have detected them. And, and that's not so crazy. I mean, this is our sensitivity, but that's only 100 years after Marconi, right? And of course, the extraterrestrials don't know when we invented radio, and they may have assumed we invented radio 100,000 years ago, and that we have instruments that are far more sensitive than this. And indeed, one sort of proposal that's been made by Frank Dre, Claudia Marconi, and uh, Eshelman at, uh, at Stanford, a very good idea is that what you really want to do is, you know, send spacecraft out about 550 AU or a little beyond and use the sun as a gravitational lens and make that your antenna, at which point you get on the order of 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 11th gain over whatever antenna you put out there. And that's the way to do these searches because, you know, with that kind of amplification, I mean, in the optical, that kind of amplification would, would allow you to see our street lights. You know, the, the sum of the streetlights from cities at the, the distances of the stars quite easily. So uh, maybe that's what they're assuming, you know, that they're, they assume we know that they have that capability, right? Or that we have that capability, I guess is what I'm really trying to say. Because that's, that's not so far into the future. I mean, you can't do this today. You can't send, you know, a radio telescope out 550 AU, but you certainly could within a century. Right? So, so maybe they're assuming that we're at least a couple of centuries further along than we are, and consequently, they have very much weaker transmitters than the kinds of things we could have found. It's very much like looking for hydrogen in elliptical galaxies. We, we couldn't find it for years and years and years, but when you have adequate sensitivity, it turned out it was pretty easy. Okay, 
So maybe we could do at least some experiments where we had you know, much lower threshold for signals. That's a very obvious brute force approach to improving SETI. One possibility, the square kilometer array, which is you know, a decade or two or so down the road, uh, they'll have 10 times the collecting area of Arecibo, so that gives you three times farther into space at any given uh, level, but it, you know, maybe a factor of 10 in, in, in signal uh, sensitivity. And you know, maybe they'll, they'll build it in a two-dimensional way, which will, of course, scale better than three-dimensional antennas. I mean, even if you took a 100-meter antenna and you just sort of beat out all the low-frequency anomalies in the receiver so that you could really integrate for a year, you could get a sensitivity of maybe 10 to the minus 29th watts per meter square per hertz. And that's, you know, that's maybe two or three orders of magnitude better than anything that's been done. So that could find beacons that are weaker, 10 to the 13 watts. 10 to the 13 watts, by the way, is, you know, you add up all the power plants in the world, that's 10 to the 13 watts. That's kind of expensive, but maybe not inconceivable. So that's just sort of a brute force approach. Another way to be smarter about SETI would be to consider special cases. Now, this is another, you know, an approach that's got a long history. Uh, this is a, one of the earlier ideas, and I remind you of it. This is a supernova opportunity. Uh, Guillermo Lumarchand and others have pointed out this idea. A supernova goes off somewhere in our galaxy, maybe in somebody else's galaxy. So all the astronomers, this, these are the Klingons here. Right? So you know, all the astronomers on the Klingon world have got their antennas, their telescopes aimed at this supernova because, of course, there's something to be learned there. But one of them is clever enough to say, wait a minute, just wait half a Klingon day, whatever that is, 15 hours, and then let's aim a transmitter the other direction, 180 degrees away. Right? So Earth is down here somewhere. And at some point, we see the supernova. So all the astronomers are looking at that supernova. And then half a Klingon day later, we get this message from the Klingons saying, hi, we're the Klingons. You want to join our book club? <laughs> so this tells you, see, the, the advantage of this scheme is that it tells you where to look and when. Another, this was a, an idea that I floated at a meeting years ago uh, in the, on the island of Capri to, uh, I should say, modest reaction. So I'll try it again here. That is, uh, binary stars with planets, this is not impossible. You can have binary stars with planets. You can either have very close binaries and stable planetary orbits that are, you know, maybe five times the separation around them. Or you can have a situation like this where the stars are separated by, say, at least the distance between the Sun and Saturn. And then you can have stable planetary orbits, you know, around each of the stars. Oh, we had a system like that. And, you know, intelligent life arose on one of the planets around one of the stars it would very quickly take advantage of the planets if there were any, or even just orbiting devices around the other star. They're in a double star system. They're going to make it take advantage of that situation. And there'll be communication back and forth. The interesting cases are the ones where the stars are aligned in such a way that they eclipse one another, so-called eclipsing binaries, as you see in this little animation. Because now, if you look at these cases, when they eclipse, when they get in front of one another, you're looking right down the communication pipeline between the two star systems, and you could expect signals. Okay, so the, the suggestion here was, why don't we look at such double star systems? The, the, the problem with this idea is that we don't really know about many double star systems that are separated by the distance between the Sun and Saturn. The, the reason is that they have periods that are measured in tens of years, and uh, so nobody knows about them. But there's the idea. Okay, again, it tells you where to look and when. Another obvious thing to do is look in the infrared. We do do optical SETI experiments. This is Shelley Wright up at the Lick Observatory. This is an experiment that Frank was actually running for a while. This box here was built mostly by Dan Wertheimer at UC Berkeley. It has several photomultiplier tubes in it. I think that's three. It uses this one meter telescope to look for nanosecond flashes of light coming from nearby stars. Uh, there are several experiments to do this at Harvard, at Berkeley. It's a good thing to do, but it's all being done in the visible for obvious reasons. We're at the bottom of an atmosphere. Uh, there was a proposal in the NSF to remove the atmosphere so we could do this in the infrared. That was not funded. So, but you could do this. I mean, obviously, you could do it from space. And there was some talk from some guys in the Netherlands, actually, who were you know, proposing experiments to put on a, 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 an infrared uh, telescope in space that they have a SETI component. But I don't know what happened. I don't think anything happened. But clearly, uh, if you have infrared telescopes, you can beat this rack. The dust in the, you know, in the, in the uh, galaxy really limits 
your visibility to stars that are maybe less than a thousand light years. Okay. So if there are really, you know, there are long distance transmissions in the optical, you really ought to go to the infrared. Another possibility, look for a really intermittent but very, very big signal. Right? Now when I say a very big signal, I mean it was a suggestion of Jack Welch at some meeting. It was an offhand comment he made during one of his talks in Paris sometime before the invention of the compass. And what Jack said was that, you know, really, there, there ought to be transmitters out there that are so powerful, optical transmitters, that even cows could see the signal. Right? I gave a talk once about cow study. I thought this was a clever idea. You, you can work the numbers. How big a laser does it take to ping the Earth with a bright flash that even a cow could see, even if they don't write it up? Okay? And it, it turns out that's a big number. But you could still expect something that's maybe as bright as a fifth magnitude star, something that somebody could see with their eye. Because if there was a flash of light in the sky tonight, right, and that was seen by a lot of people, you would study the heck out of that part of the sky. It only needs to be a one-bit transmission telling you there's something in that direction. And then you would expend a lot of resources studying that direction, presumably looking for the far weaker signal that would tell you that there's something interesting there. Now, one way to look at these big honking signals is an idea that Frank had to broach during a coffee break once. And he pointed out that the moon is actually kind of a garden ball reflector. Right, uh, you know, and, and so at radio frequencies, and so if you just look at the moon, you're essentially looking at the entire universe, or at least half of it, actually more. Okay, you're looking at the whole universe like looking into a garden ball. You see the whole sky at once. Right, so if you're looking for meteors, for example, maybe that's a better way to do it. Right, the problem here is that because of the geometric effects, your sensitivity is down by oh, 50,000 or thereabouts. But if you're talking about a really, really powerful signal, maybe this is worth doing. Maybe somebody should just be aiming an antenna with a 30-minute beam at the moon all the time, looking for something. You need two of them, because if you just found one flash, maybe you, you, know, you wouldn't know what it was. If you saw two, you might think it's a lunar phenomenon. Who knows? But this is not you know, such a crazy idea. All sky, all the time. Here's another, what I think is an important point for SETI, being smarter. And that is the fact that, in a way, we have been broadcasting longer than since the Second World War. They know about our chlorophyll, right? Because that's a two billion year old signal. They know that there's oxygen in the atmosphere. And that might serve as an incentive for them to do something about us. Uh, now that depends on how many worlds show chlorophyll. Let's assume that life is commonplace. You know, maybe one in a hundred, one in a thousand planets develop oxygen in their atmosphere. I mean, of course we don't know. But if that is a common enough occurrence, then maybe advanced societies who've got the funding to build the kind of instruments that could find these, build the terrestrial planet finders and so forth, they may have long lists of so-called bio-worlds. And we're just on that list because they found this planet at some point. They found that the Earth has chlorophyll. So here's, oh, here you go, Zork. Here's another planet with life. Okay. Now, if there's large numbers of these, then it's maybe not so unreasonable that, to assume that some of them may have developed intelligent life. Okay, so maybe they go through the list. Right? They don't spend a lot of time in each one because, you know, uh, it, I mean, we've had chlorophyll for, uh, you know, at least a couple hundred thousand times longer than we've had radio transmitters. But if you have a list of a few hundred thousand of these, then it's not unreasonable to assume that one of them might get your pain. So here's, here's a straw man idea. Uh, maybe they do an optical ping, a billion targets if they have that many. All you need is that one bit. Just tell them we're here. This is this part, part of the sky you need to be interested in. So if you give them a nanosecond you can ping, uh, you can work out, you know, all right, a sufficiently bright flash that it's easy to see with almost any experiment. Uh, that's a duty cycle. Well, all right, so that's a five gigawatt laser. That's, you know, that's not impossible. It's not impossible. And this just could be an automatic experiment. That all it does is it just goes and pings, you know, 100 million or a billion known worlds with life telling them this is where to look. And then you have some sort of omnidirectional antenna that's obviously a far lower power that has the information, whatever that information is, Encyclopedia Galactica, you know, whatever, used car listings, whatever it is that you want to broadcast to the galaxies. So I, I think that considerations like this lead me to think that a two-tier transmitting strategy from the alien's point of view actually makes sense. The first tier is just 
to get somebody's attention. Just the one bit signal. Just the one bit signal that's very intermittent. Okay, so ping them, ping these bio worlds, for example, with these very short here I am signals. By the way, if you make the signal sufficiently short, that also reduces guessing at the other end about what frequency to look at because it's at all frequencies. Uh, and the message, of course, the actual bits, the information, that's in the harder to find signal, but that, that's the signal that you would you know, continue to look for as long as you could. Uh, by the way, this is, uh, this is also interesting because when you shorten a signal by a factor of two, right, but with, for the same energy expenditure, now the amplitude is twice what it was, the noise has only gone up by the square root of two. So it's actually more, you know, it's more efficient to have short signals rather than longer ones. Okay, so just to summarize that logic again. They don't know we're here. So we're in a, you know, Earth is not special particularly. We're just in a list, a list of worlds known to have biology. If that list is not long, it's not, uh, you know, it's not so good. But let's assume that it is long, greater than, you know, 100,000 or something, because the time scale for life's existence is far longer, we think, than the time scale for intelligent life's existence. Maybe we'll prove that wrong. That would surprise me, but it could happen. Okay. So that means that they're, you know, they'll be sending pings to lots of worlds. The ping will be intermittent. It will be short. And maybe we should have some more experiments where we look for very short pulses with reasonable rep rates. We don't know what the rep rates might be, of course, but minutes to days. You know, that, that's, that's just a guess. Uh, the, the group at Berkeley actually does something like this. They have something called ASCO pulse, and they're looking for microsecond pulses, not, not short ones in this. And the message is that always on weak isotropic signal. Okay, uh, let me just give you a concrete example of another way to beat this synchronicity problem, this intersecting bullets problem. This was a short experiment we did here at the SETI Institute this last summer. Uh, I already said that. And that is to use as a clock transits of the sun. Okay. So here you see a planet transiting the sun over and over. It doesn't seem to bother going around the back. Uh, <laughs> we thought, you know, here's a clock that, that tells the aliens when and where to broadcast in our direction. Send a signal that arrives when we are transiting the sun as seen from their world. Okay. So all that means is that all we have to do is look in this direction opposite to the sun all the time. And we will eventually get this ping from somebody who has noticed our transit, knows that this is an Earth-like world. Well, obviously, it is an Earth-like world. And they send a signal to arrive here during that transit as seen from their star system. So we will see it in the anti-sun direction. Uh, we proposed this at a, this was a poster paper at a bioastronomy meeting um, back in 2004 with Ray Ballard, Ray Ballard and I did it. And we thought, all right, this is a clever idea. And, but then it turned out, actually we wrote it all up, that yeah, maybe it was a clever idea, but we weren't the first to think of it. Actually, guys across the street at NASA Ames had already <laughs> written something about it in 2000. You know, well, those guys are smarter than we are. But it turned out that actually, and I think Peter Backus was pointing out the fact that the, the Russians had actually thought of this in 1980. As far as I can tell, all the ideas in SETI were thought of by the Russians in the 1970s and 80s. The Russians are always claiming that they invented all this stuff first, and I now believe it's probably true. They probably didn't invent everything first. Anyhow, so the idea is an old one, but it's, it's not a bad one. It's, it's actually, I think, a pretty good one, because again, it tells you where to look and when. And so we did this little experiment here, just using Allen Telescope Array, so here's the people involved. And this was presented at the uh, International Astronautics Congress in Prague a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's just a preliminary experiment. But what makes it interesting is, A, the fact that it does tell you where to look, but also the fact that it makes it a little bit easier on the aliens. They don't need 10 to the 17 watts to make this work because they know exactly where you're going to be. You're going to be transiting that star over there, okay? And even if they have a transmitter that isn't, it's kind of sloppy, and they just, you know, send a beam that fills the entire solar system out to, say, Jupiter, thinking you're probably not farther away from your, your sun than that, then they only need a two-watt transmitter. Right? It's like a flashlight, okay? Uh, if, if they're better than that, if they can make the beam smaller to the size of the sun, because they know you're transiting the sun, so you're, not, you're in the beam, if they make the beam the size of the sun, like that, then of course they only need two microwatts, right? It's, it's less than a laser pointer. And if they can find the Earth in front of the sun, then they only need a fraction of a nanowatt. So this makes it cheap in terms of the energy consumption, right? It's a completely order, different order of magnitude in terms of the power requirements. However, there is this. 
tells you where to look. Uh, there is this. If they're going to do it just as you're transiting the sun, they need to know the distance from their transmitter to the sun to within a few light hours. Right? That's pretty good astrometry. Maybe, maybe not impossible. That's parallax measurement good to, you know, 10 to the minus 8 arc seconds, which is half a million times better than Hipparchus. <laughs> well, that's better than we're doing. But on the other hand, it's you know, only 150 years after the first parallax experiment succeeded here on Earth. So maybe, I don't know, maybe they can do it. But actually, uh, it's not really necessary. Right? As long as they send a ping every five hours or something like that, it really doesn't matter because it will eventually intersect you when you are transiting the star. And then at that point, they don't need any astrometry. Right? They just need to know. They, they, if they have a very narrow beam, then they need to know the proper motion of your star so that you know, by the time the signal gets to you, you have moved out of the way, that kind of thing. But that's not so hard. The, the, those constraints are not, not so bad. So in fact, this is, this is not a very hard thing for them to do. And I think that, uh, again, that this is something that we ought to try doing. We did try these preliminary uh, observations in June and July. This was the configuration. 25 of the uh, 42 antennas at the Allen Telescope Array were used. Those were the ones that were operating. We had a fairly large synthesized beam. We actually didn't want a synthesized beam, but that's you know, the way the experiment was run. Uh, this is just a, a pattern of some of these spots on the sky that we look at. The system is not terribly well set up for looking at the sun, which is a moving target. So that, that we need some good software development to do this again. But as I say, this was a preliminary experiment. We looked at a couple hundred positions, very tiny fraction of the ecliptic strip, in fact, and obviously for only 100 seconds at a time in any given direction. So it's very, very incomplete, very incomplete. But I do point out that this experiment could have found a transmitter you know, even if it uh, beamed everything inside of Jupiter's orbit, it was only 15 watts or more. So, uh, you know, an interesting thing to do. And I think that we could do this experiment better because it, this seems like such an obvious thing to do, such a, you know, a clever idea that, that makes such evident sense in minimizing the amount of cost at the other end that uh, maybe it's worth doing this again. Uh, more ET antennas would, would allow you to do this much faster. The other possibility is to use a dedicated antenna, like this one on the... Uh, you know, just south of Kronigan in the Netherlands, this is the Domingo 25 meter telescope, which at 21 centimeters has a beam which is, you know, the size of the sun, half a degree. All right, so just perfect, just perfect. And uh, this, this antenna was actually mothballed a couple of years ago. This thing was built in the early 1950s. Uh, but they didn't actually really, well, they did mothball it, but there's an amateur group that has taken it over and shot it full of grease and made it work again, okay? And, uh, and I've been in, in, in touch with the guys there, and they say, well, you know, you might be able to convince these guys, if you paid them a little bit of money, so those of you who brought your checkbook, uh, pay them a little bit of money, we could put, you know, maybe one of these astropulse receivers on this thing, and just have it spend a good part of a year just looking at the anti-solar direction. It's an obvious way to do it. Another possibility, it turns out that the Vesterborg Synthesis Telescope, for those of you who know that instrument, you also a photo of it, uh, is putting multi-beam receivers on there on the uh, antennas, but two of the antennas will not get those multi-beam receivers, so there'll be two antennas sort of left over. And again, those are 25 meter antennas, same, same as this, really. So those are things that could be used for this experiment. If you could get one of them to, you know, just make it a dedicated instrument for looking at the anti-solar direction. Online, cheap pings, and it tells you where to look. All right, just finally, I do this in every talk, but I, I do want to point out to you that I, I always worry that we're being a little bit provincial in SETI, about our assumptions about what's at the other end. Uh, these are the kinds of things that astrobiologists talk about in terms of what ET might be like. These are all essentially descriptions of your next door neighbors. This is uh, Hans Moravec's prediction of what your next door neighbor will be like in 20 years. He's plotted here the amount of compute power you buy per dollar over time. And although this is a 10 year old plot, the point is today for $1,000 you buy the compute power of a lizard. And by 2020, and which may be of interest to you if you're selling car insurance, and then the point is that by 2020, $1,000 buys you the compute power of you. And so the point here is that maybe this is the generation, or maybe it's the next generation, that invents our successors. Right? So if you ask what ET is going to be like, you can say, well, maybe they're going to be these you know, guys that are sort of carbon-based, you know, you know, monochrome chirality, and all that stuff. But on the other hand, if they're only a couple of hundred years beyond the invention of radio, they may not be biological at all. Now, this has become a fairly uh, commonplace refrain, these days. A lot of people have been saying this now. 
I, I made this little graph a couple years ago just to show you what I mean by this. Here's the evolution of a horse, which 60 million years ago was the size of a collie dog, and not terribly useful for carrying chariots around or warfare or anything like that, but there wasn't a whole lot of that. 60 million years. So this is what Darwin did in 60 million years. Horses went from here to the size of a horse. This is what computers have done in the last 35 years. Right? I, had a, I had a computer in 1977, had a one megahertz clock rate and 8-bit buzz and so forth. The computer I have at home is many thousands of times better than that. So that's factors of thousands in 35 years. So that's the point, that this is all very much faster. Whoops. Now people say, yeah, yeah, but we're going to put the computers in our brains. We'll go to you know, some sort of board, board like mentality. That may be, but you know, th this can never compete with the pure machines in the end. So I think you can forget these guys, these soft, squishy aliens. Uh, Ray Kurzweil was at the Institute of about, I don't know, six months ago. And he said, yes, this is inevitable. We're going to invent our successors. It's going to be machine intelligence. And they're going to be nanobots, and they're going to spread out. It sounds like the three stooges. Spread out and start eating up the cosmos. Now, <laughs> as far as we know, this hasn't happened, but of course, maybe we don't know. Maybe they've eaten everything except our local neighborhood. Um, it doesn't strike me, uh, and I asked Ray about this, but he, he was very invasive in his response. Um, it, this doesn't seem to me like the way to go. You don't want to distribute, you know, distributed computing is maybe not the way to go if you, what you really want to do is be a master of the universe, not to work on Wall Street, but to. The work in interstellar space because you don't want time of flight problems between the various components of your brain. And what you really want to do is another idea of Kurzweil's, you know, use computronium, a maximum highest density computing device, whatever it is. Here's a picture of it. It's extremely like, like your brain. Okay. So I think that probably they would be, com you know, compact. But really, the point is not so much how they're built, but where would they be? And what does this mean for SETI if this is true? If you only have a couple of hundred years of biological intelligence between the invention of radio and the invention of machines that pick up and leave and do their own thing, then where should you be looking for the majority of the intelligence in the cosmos, which is probably not biological? And that's a very difficult question, because you really have very little insight into what's of interest to these guys. I think you have some interest, sorry, some insight into what the first generation of these guys might be like. The AI people say, you know, the first generation will, will instill moral behavior which is to say, you know, they'll, they'll behave well, they won't try and do anything nasty to us, so we won't have to pull the plug. But I think that the second generation is beyond your control. Uh, about the only thing I can think of is that, uh, there are a few things I can think of, but, you know, they want matter and energy, so let's just stick with that. Um, and so you might want to look at places where there's a lot of energy, which are places that, in general, we never look at, we say, like O stars, right? O stars, big bright stars, a lot of the, you know, the stars you see with your naked eye are these kinds of stars, you know, big giants that are very, very hot. Lots of energy, but not terribly interesting for biological intelligence, because they, they burn out quickly. So here you go, tens of thousands of times more energy than the sun. Molecular clouds, there's a lot of material there, and hot stars. We never look at molecular clouds. All right, here's the Orion cloud. So these, you know, highly condensed clouds of material, very hot stars embedded in these. There's the Penrose idea, where you throw your garbage at a black hole, that you're circling, and you can extract a lot of energy that way. You can get a lot of energy out of a black hole. Whatever shortcomings black holes may have for your lifestyle, one thing they do supply is a lot of energy. So that might be a place where we should look. Um, and in fact, I'll go ahead and that. There's a lot of uh, literature on black holes as possible mode of intelligence. I kind of like box obules because they literally fit just within the beam of a. Uh, of, of our radio telescopes. And again, you've got a lot of material here, and usually some hot stars at Box 68. A couple hundred solar masses of material. Very cold. If you're a machine, maybe you want it to be very cold in your environment, because that, you know, that improves your thermodynamic efficiency. <coughs> this is the only unambiguous singular point in the galaxy, the galactic center. The Benfords uh, have uh, made a strong point that this is some place we ought to be looking. Again, this, the, Jill mentioned our experiment to do this actually at Vestergaard for four hours, which was the amount of time that the Dutch Foundation gave us to observe. And they candidly admitted, well, we're going to give you this four hours of time, not because we think you'll have any chance of finding ET, but you may find some instrumental problems with the uh, Vestergaard policy. <laughs> uh, it's hard to look at the Galactic Center because there's a lot of natural radiation so that you know, tends to mess up your receiver baselines and things like that. But this is a place where you really would want to look. Just to get just the bottom line of all this is that the public, in particular, 
regard SETI as a static enterprise, right? That we're sitting around with the earphones, as <laughs> Jody Foster did, you know, listening for ET, and that this year's experiment is like last year's experiment, except there have been a, you know, a couple of hundred thousand cups of coffee that have gone by or something. <laughs> In fact, it's changing. This is just a plot of some of the biggest telescopes, radio telescopes, as a function of time. And you know, if you threw out a few points, maybe this wouldn't be so obvious. But if you believe this point up here, and certainly you have to believe that point down there, there is a you know one or two orders of magnitude increase in size of the largest antennas per century. Uh, so you know that's one point. The instruments are getting better. Despite the vagaries of funding for any particular instrument, the instruments are getting better, bigger. And in addition, the speed of the search, and my index of the speed of the search here, is the number of simultaneous channels that you can monitor. Those are the black dots here. And those follow Moore's law, because that's just digital electronics. So you put all this together, and you know, on average, SETI experiments increase in speed every, well, they double every couple of years. Okay, so it isn't the same experiment year after year after year. Having said that, this is a photo made at the basement of the SETI Institute, and it digs back on Lansing's Drive in June of 1997. And those of you who are familiar with some of the people that worked here re will recognize Kent Colors in the, the front there, the blind physicist that was the prototype for the character in the uh, Jody Foster film, our CEO Tom Pearson in the back, and some other people who worked here. We had found a signal that for you know, most of the day looked very enticing. And while this was, in fact, not ET, it was the SOHO satellite, it was a very, in my mind, very fortuitous thing that this uh, little misidentification, which lasted, as I say, about 16 hours, occurred. Because it showed what really happens if you pick up a signal. And beyond that, it was very exciting for a while. This hasn't happened for real. But what I'm trying to tell you is that if this enterprise is well motivated, it will be happening for real within your lifetime. Okay, that's it. there is the brightness of our star, right? because all you're doing is counting photons, so if you have a bigger, you know, I mean, there's no real limitation, because you can always go to a bigger mirror, collect more photons, right? I mean, our planet dims the sun by about one part in 10 to the 4, right? So you can do the statistics yourself and work out how many photons. I mean, somebody here from Kepler probably could tell you how, uh, how far away you could do that with a 100-inch telescope. My, my guess is on the order of 50, 100 light years, 200 light years, something like that. But is somebody here from Kepler? Who can Several that? people. Yeah, here. So the the stars in the Kepler field of view, which are um, dim enough that they're not saturated and bright enough that they're distinct as stars to the instrument, are between 600 and 3,000 light years in, in distance. And there, there actually does get to be a problem when you're so far away that you're down to, that, that the sun looks like you know 18th, 19th, 20th magnitude because that's you know at that level you have a background where every pixel has a star like that on it. Yeah. So at that point your confusion limit, right? Right. Okay. So there's there's, there's probably that. Like yeah. Yeah. So one thing you haven't talked about is without talking about monoliths on the moon, as it were, is what if they've actually put the probes, say, in the solar system? Are there potential techniques to find that way? I mean, I appreciate it's a hard way to look, but you can make the assumption they're always at their home star system, rather than they've already moved out the solar probes and are looking at us and maybe beaming information back in their direction. Yeah, well, it's certainly been discussed, the idea of, of uh, solar system probes. I always sort of wonder, what's the point? having a probe because, you know, for them to report back takes as long as for them just to wait for Island Lucy. But on the other hand, the probe could, in fact, generate higher quality information. So maybe there is, I, I, no, no aspersions to be cast on Desi Lou production here, but so this is a possibility. Uh, the difficulty is, as you've already noted, there are several difficulties. John Dreher used to always talk about the fact that, you know, small probes have a problem in that, you know, 
the physical limits on antenna size. You need a big antenna. So there's a problem there. He thought there was a problem. But I think the real difficulty is where do you look and how? How do you find these things? It might be very cryptic, very hard to find. I mean, you know, it's hard to find an asteroid that's the size of this building, right? So it would be difficult. Uh, some, some searches have been made at uh, Lagrange points four and five. An optical search was made numerous years ago. You can find it in the literature. And they ruled out anything smaller than on the order of, uh, you know, between 100 meters and a kilometer or something like that, depending on the albedo. Okay. Uh, Frank has mentioned to me that they, uh, an unpublished work, they actually aimed the Arecibo radar at one of the Lagrange points. And, but the trouble is the Lagrange points are very big compared to the Arecibo beam, so they didn't do the whole thing. Frank, what, what was the deal there? <coughs> you just described how we did radar studies at but <coughs> Arecibo can detect an object uh, well, a meter in diameter or less, actually, at that distance. But the problem is uh, that the Arecibo radar, because of computer limitations, can only examine a small uh, fraction of the ray path in distance. Uh, and also the beam is small, and actually the things at the Lagrange points are the Lagrange points, they wander around. So in fact, if studying the Lagrange points, you have to study at large volume, <coughs> and the air radar radar does, just doesn't do that. There's a narrow beam, and can only look over a small range of distances. And so, in DB search, we saw nothing, and but that doesn't say much. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good experiment to do that, at least. If, you, if you're going to search the entire ecliptic, <coughs> Maybe the best thing to do is to look for uh, NEOs, and maybe in the course of that search, you find something. Seth, there's a question. I want to um, ask you, please, to explore the assumption that we're on the list of places with chlorophyll, and we have been for long enough to anybody who would be making such a list uh, would already have been able to send probes and learn more about us, and then maybe stop by. Um, is there any reason, I mean, that a species after they've colonized a few planets would want to do anything else than just silently buzz uh, a place, especially a place that's constantly broadcasting uh, things like widespread panic would ensue if there's ever any <coughs> aliens detected? So, you know, and, and just occasionally disable a few nukes here and there. I mean, is there, I mean, after you've colonized five or seven worlds, I mean, what, what else is there to do? I mean, we, we wipe oil off birds, right? But we don't, you know, we don't try to talk to the birds, at least not every day, I, I do occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> well, you ever talk back? Like, Some of them do, actually, don't they? Um, well, I don't know what to say to that. I, I, unfortunately, I think that that falls into the category, again, of alien sociology. And, and since, you know, you don't even know whether the aliens are biological or not, in my opinion, you know, most of them are not even biological, I, I, think, uh, I think that they're, they're, they're going to be inscrutable, mostly. I mean, I, I don't know that you can second-guess their motivation. That's, that's all I'm saying. I wouldn't base too much of your search strategy on their motivations. Obviously, there's implicit in all of this is the assumption that they make some sort of signal that you can detect. I mean, that's a very fundamental implicit assumption. And, and in that I may even not even be justified. Sometimes some of my colleagues talk about the altruism, right? that they, they're willing to make some noise to, to uh, let us know that you know, they're there. Well, all you have to do is look at the controversy surrounding the matter of active SETI. It was just a little thing held by the Royal Society, in fact, in the UK a couple of weeks ago, in which we discussed whether we should be broadcasting. And you, I think Jim can tell you, that it, 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 it's a very, very heated debate whether even we should broadcast. This, despite the fact, I will stand on my soapbox for three seconds here, that we have been broadcasting for 60 or 70 years, signals that are very easy for them to find if they, for example, do something like you know, use their own star as a gravitational lens. But this is, this is very heated, so to say that you know what the aliens are going to do, I, I don't know that there's very good reason to believe anything about that. Question here. Uh, <coughs> when, when will we have our own list of bio-worlds? How many worlds, how far out, and, and to what detail? And, and what sort of instrumentation will be required? Well, I think that that depends on your bank account. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and the terrestrial planet finder, you know, is now on sort of indefinite hold. It's really been sort of canceled. That, that would have been a first step in that direction. Uh, did you want to say something about this problem? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it is strictly a money issue. The, the technical. I had a dinner with a colleague from Holland who works at Space Telescope Science Institute, Ron Allen, a couple of weeks ago, and he told me that all the technical difficulties, the technical hurdles for building such an instrument that an instrument that could actually 
see extracellular planets and get enough spectral information to look for things like methane and, and oxygen and so forth. Yet these have been solved, but the problem is that there's not the budget. It's a budget problem. So this is this is one of those things that the answer depends on the money. I have so many so many questions to go for. Yeah, uh, Seth. Uh, there actually was an optical search of the Lagrange points uh, a decade or more ago. Well, I referred to that one. That was the one that yeah. Did. And they didn't find anything larger than about a bulb plug. Larger than I'm sorry, Jim, I didn't hear that. It's larger than a bulb plug. Bulb plug. Yeah, I don't think it was that small actually, but it, but it did it, it did depend on the alpha. Okay, one last question in the back. Let's go back kind of a budget and technology question. So lots of charities are doing things like donate your car to our charity. And I'm wondering if the SETI Institute has considered, because there are, are zillions of satellites and companies are putting them out and they get decommissioned eventually, donate your about to be decommissioned satellite to SETI. We'll turn it around 180 degrees and we'll use it until it crashes into the atmosphere. Uh, when you say satellite, you don't mean satellite dish or so many people. You mean I mean like or orbiting the Earth, satellite communication satellites that that. Um, what would you use it for? I don't know. Could you use it to listen? Usually, they have pretty small antennas on there, and not particularly good they're receivers. Not, you know, they're mostly in an atmosphere. Yeah, they're mostly, well. That's that's true. I Actually, don't know many of them are you know, very sensitive. And, and normally, if you put if you put people say all the time, why don't you move this whole experiment into space? There's some places that move it into space that <laughs> makes sense. Well, money, of course, but you know the backside of the moon is good because the backside of the moon is permanently shielded from all the uh, the noise here. But just putting it up into orbit, you know, low Earth orbit or, or even higher, you know, exposes it to like the, the RFI, the interference from a third of the Earth or more. Right? So that's not necessarily a very good idea. And these satellites, of course, are small. They they don't have hundred meter dishes affixed to them. And we now require that at the end of the lifetime they be boosted up so that they're not causing more debris. Yeah. But that's an insurance problem. All right, can we, <laughs> can we thank Seth one more time?